Welcome to the first session of four for TomTom Tom Tools. Um, this will be held every Wednesday from now until May 6th. Please make sure um, everyone that's listening that you do um, have the capability to see our webcams um, because there will be some live demonstrations throughout the process or some other uh, visuals. Um, Without further ado, this is the Tom Tom Ovality Sensor presentation. My name is Tom Zeng, a Senior Engineer for Industrial Kiln and Dryer. And today we have a special guest, uh, Thomas Stutz, the co-founder of Tom Tom Tools. How are you doing today, Thomas? Hello, fine, thank you. Hi, Tom. <laughs> okay, so Thomas, uh, tell me, uh, tell me about uh, where you where you come from, your experience, uh, why you're qualified. So I'm a mechanical engineer and uh, working in cement since 2003. So in cement machine, in maintenance. And um, yeah, and my passion for, I have the passion for uh, analytics and condition monitoring and uh, right. these things. So that's why I came to it. So you, when you did the maintenance, you did a lot of diagnostics, from what I understand. Uh, um, when the kiln's running, how to how to do measures on on the health of the kiln. Is that yes. your main responsibility? Yes, exactly. Yeah, mainly to prepare the the, the bigger repairs, to do okay. the forecast. What kind of spare parts do we need? What should be the roadmap? in doing maintenance on the long-term view. So that's why right. we need to we need to have a, a good understanding about the condition. Right, right. Well, um, overall, I understand you, um, you're co-founder of TomTom Tom Tools with uh, Thomas Reiniger. So how did you guys know each other and, and, and how did you get started with TomTom? Tom? Uh, we uh, we started in the in the same company. We started at the same day, so mm -hmm. in the cement company and uh, in the maintenance department. And um, yeah, there there we were often asked, "Hey, uh, how how long can we still run with that in this condition or in this situation? Or what do you think? Uh, do we need to put it uh, into the next year budget, or do we need this?" Uh, components early or you know, these kind of question came we came across with uh, with that and um, sometimes we had no answer and then because we didn't know and we couldn't measure often so we had to rely on uh, on information from others and sometimes uh, yeah this was not uh, not uh, so quickly available. So we had to right. improvise and maybe doing some measurements with some uh, handmade tools, you know. Right, right. <laughs> and then we saw the need and that we can do with some measurement tools. We can, uh, with simple tools, we can, it helps a lot sometimes when we talk about run out measurements on gears or play from a shaft or something is moving. Right. So, and that's that's how it started. So I, I understand you guys travel to a lot of different kilns because uh, you know you globally travel to a lot of different places. Um, and I understand that what you what you had versus what you ended up um, developing it was a large it was was it cumbersome to carry the the different diagnostic tools or how how did that work? Oh yes, of course at the you know, the the more information we want, the more different tools we need, and then we right. need to carry. And the the, co the cement companies, they are or the plants, they are spread all around the world. So we had to travel mainly with uh, by airplane. So luggage was always restricted. So and right. then it was also the wish for us to have something small, tiny pocket size, uh, if possible. All right. But on the other side, we have to measure on very big machines. So usually on cement kilns or uh, on uh, vertical roller mills. 
for whole meals. So we had to find a way how to measure big things with small with small tools. And uh, right, so and that's and we were looking in the market what is available, and we tried to use whatever we found uh, and not reinvent the wheel ourselves. So that was not not really the our intention to to make right. things which other are already doing. So we tried to get whatever we could and only to to develop things which are not available in the market. Right. So you ultimately ended up making it yourselves because it was just uh, very painful to to go to a lot of different places with bulk, very bulky types of tools. You needed to make it small enough that it's easy to travel, yet robust enough to be able to handle the 700 degree um, um, Fahrenheit or 400 C range types of shell temps and the ruggedness of the environment, um, which is ultimately how uh, Sometimes tools got started, right? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, uh, by our own need for our own purpose, we started. Right. Um, right. And uh, we wanted also to make tools simple that sometimes we not need to travel ourselves. So we just sent the tool and the people could measure themselves and send the data uh, back to us. So that mm. was then the, the, the step further, not having only a traveling ourselves all the time. It's easier to, to send a tool and then people send us back the data. But for that, the tools need to be somehow user friendly and easy to use. Mm, that is true, because I, I remember when I first used the ovality sensor, it was uh, very uh, straightforward. OK, so. So tell me a little bit about TomTom Tom Tools. Uh, you guys started in 2007. Um, as you as you guys see on the map, audience is um, Industrial Kiln and Dryer is the North American um, distributor and exclusive partner for TomTom Tom Tools. Uh, you guys sell your tools in a lot of different countries, right? Yes. So yeah. So that are not our branches in all the black dots so that are uh, the right. tools are used so we are small co we are still a very small company we are based in switzerland and work together with you already for several years and right. uh, we have some some partnerships and uh, some some people who could assist uh, locally let's say in india or in brazil and uh, in thailand right so, right and I would say we we use these all the time. We use it in our own uh, services too. They're they're very um, easy to use, very uh, straightforward. Now the the part that's interesting is getting into more of the nuances, which we'll talk about on the ovality sensor. So um, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about the ovality sensor, Thomas? Um, um, how you ended up making the tool. Um, I was, is this one of the first tools that you guys made? <clears throat> no, it's, it was not the first. It was one, uh, one of the first, but not uh, the first. Uh, it, okay. Uh, uh, this tool came out of our experience with uh, measurement of uh, torque on, um, on vertical roller mill drives, you know, the mm -hmm. torque measurement by strain gauges. And right. uh, on the other side, we had to measure ovality on kilns. So the ovality is shown here in the graph. Or if mm -hmm. I use my cup example, you know, okay. it's kind of. I'll, uh, uh, I'll go ahead and make it to where you guys can see <laughs> Thomas doing the cup it's example. Uh, elastic, elastic uh, deformation. So this is uh, the ovality, and it's not. It's not the same as a permanent deformation, but it's something elastic. And that's why we usually had a big beam. I think you have one in your office there to show. Right, right, right. We'll, uh, let me show. Yeah, I'll show the, the office one in comparison. Um, you guys should be able to see the office one. Uh, Thomas, can you uh, turn off that webcam for a sec? I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom out for you guys. Oops. I gotta go up. 
Gotta, there we go. Yes. So that was so uh... we had to carry in the beginning. Yes. <laughs> and this was uh, right. one meter for us. Our model was one meter. And then with uh, the strain gauges, we had the idea that we we should be able to um, to make it smaller by using a different method uh, to measure, but giving right. the same result at the end. And that's why uh, we starting developing these uh, small tools. So uh, as you showed, so it's a yeah. quarter a quarter of the of the length a quarter of the length than what we had uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the method is uh, by, by strain gauges. And you can show it here. And maybe you can see that. So it's deflecting. It has a, right. a deflection plate in the middle. And there are strain gauges below on this uh, plate. And this plate is hold to the kiln by four strong magnets. So that means when this when the kiln shell is deflecting by by the load, the deflection plate from the tool is following the shape as we would make a sticker here on the cup and we deform it and the sticker tape would deform in the same way. And this method was applied here. Right. Uh, theoretically, we could uh, we could glue strain gauges directly to the king gel, and we get the same result. But then it would be a, a one-time measurement. And right. with these the magnets, we can we can place it on different places in the, on the king. So that's why we came to this idea. So we did some tests, and then at the end it worked. And uh, since then we are we are uh, manufacturing that. So it's since 2009, I guess, we were the first test. Right. So let's uh, talk a little bit about why do an ovality. Why do an ovality measurement? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, when I go back to the to the cup, you see it's a right. it's a thin and elastic, and you see it here on the screen. It's the the principle of, of ovality. I mean, here it's a much stronger uh, shown, so it's exaggerated that we can see it. In reality, these deformations are very very small. We cannot see it by eyes. We can only right. measure it with. Uh, uh, high amplification. But what are the, the areas of interest? They are on top of the key. So the gap. And the gap we have that we can allow the key shell to expand, thermal expansion, so that it does not get uh, locked in into the tire or into the ring. So we have mm -hmm. a free expansion. We need a certain gap, but if the gap is too big, then we get we get deformation like a collapse. Uh, it's kind of collapsing on top because the shell is compared to the load. It's a very thin, it's very thin material. So uh, we get a flat a flattening on the top. So that's one point of interest. And the other point of interest is when the in the area over over the rollers, the support rollers. As we have only two rollers per tire, so we have a two line contact which deforms the tire a little bit, depending on how strong is the tire, how thick it is. Um, and these two areas, they generate uh, this kind of a picture or cross section of the key, like on the next slide. Um, yes, you see this. Uh, shape like a, sometimes also looks like a skull shape and uh, right. this shape um, makes the, the shell deforming with each turn and uh, these deformations are small 
but for the refractory they are not very nice uh, you see especially at the place place maybe at two o'clock and ten o'clock position you see that uh, yes there you see that the bricks they get more squeezed because the curvature or the the radius gets a little bit reduced and exactly in the middle the radius and that 12 o'clock position the radius or the curve is the highest or the biggest so okay. that means there is always a, a squeezing or compression and release of the refractory and uh, the refractory is a, a more or less uh, brittle uh, material so they don't really like to get squeezed uh, too much so elasticity is very limited so that means they can get crushed you see it, uh, as on the slide they, they can get crushed or they can get loose by a small wear between them wear and uh, they can when they get loose then they start to move they can even relatively move inside the kinjin and when they are moving then we can get uh, this kind of uh, twisted refractory or uh, they can even collapse the rings can collapse because they are not uh, not rigid not uh, uh, not so tight installed anymore and this risk is uh, mainly under the tires mm. so overall with ovality it's if it's high for impact on refractory if it squeezes and loosens, squeezes and loosens over time, yes. you will have brick loss or refractory loss. And then and then you have yes. a whole series of events. Shell gets hot, hot spot, and then you have ultimately failures. Exactly. Um, so we have a few images here on this one. We got the sensor on the left. We have a, um, these are the limits that we typically recommend for the ovality and then some uh, some data sets on the right. Uh, if you talk a little bit about some of these data sets, so one of them, it seems like it's relatively circular and one of them looks more or less like a teardrop or a heart shape. Yes, exactly. You see the one on the upper one, it uh, maintains or the shell maintains a very round shape. So the gap right. is very small on top so it, it stays very round and the other one has a quite a bigger uh, a big um, a valley uh, let's say right, it's not right. as round as the other one so the, the ovality is higher ovality is the relation between the smallest uh, radius or uh, and the biggest one in the graph and this in relation to the Kiln diameter, so that's why the unit is a percentage. And mm. you see the table there uh, below. You see the table where it's a recommended area. It's in green. Right. Okay, we have to say a recommended for the refractory. Uh, the recommended area would be as low as possible. The lower, the better. But when we are low, right. then, we have, then we have to make sure that we still have uh, a certain gap on top that we do not get locked, that the tire is not locking the kill shell. So that's why right. this, uh, this risk uh, will be there. So too low is not good uh, for the kill shell, and um, too high is also not good for the kill shell, but mainly not good for the refractory. So on uh, uh, one one thing I, I did learn over the years on see this one up on the measure on the top the one that looks relatively good as a circle is if that happens I typically remeasure now if it, especially if it's near the tire because sometimes it could just be too far away from the tire then you don't get the influence of the uh, of that constriction between the tire and the roller. So, so that's where sometimes I'll see that data set and I'll remeasure it. And if it changes, then it's just I was too far away because there's no influence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, the, the influence of ovality is uh, main, is under the tire. 
Right. The highest duality is in the middle of the tire, but we cannot measure under the tire, so we measure right and left. Right. Well, uh, you know, we, we've done some work now with some, some of the places outside of ovality where we use it on uh, stiffener rings for dryers, and we've seen some major deformation due to the stress it pulls um, at those particular spots. So even the, because the ovality sensor uses strain gauges, our goal is to figure out how that deforms on the shell. So this technology is very useful even outside of a normal ovality at the kiln, uphill and downhill at the tires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we talked a little bit about the size difference. We actually sh we actually can show the size difference um, comparing the ovality sensor with the ovality beam. The ovality beam is overall a um, a mechanical type of um, measure because there's no electronics in it. You almost need the beam to be large to be able to handle some of the deformations on the on the shell. So can you talk a little bit about um, going through the strain gauge, how you ended up um, thinking about the strain gauge? I think you mentioned you you guys originated with some of the torque measures with uh, with a vertical roller mill or a vertical mill. So what's the story behind the sensor compared to the beam? Uh, you mean related to strain gauges or to the mills? Uh, the strain gauge. Uh, tell me the story on how you went from something that was about a meter, meter and a half, down to about a quarter of it. I mean, what were some oh, of the yeah. design challenges? Yes. I mean, a strain gauge is a very, very tiny thing. Uh, so a strain gauge right. is like a resistor which you glue on a metal surface. It's a very, very small thing. And um, uh, the length does not really matter anymore. With the other one, with the old traditional way, we had three points. We measure the three points, and with three points, uh, let's say an arc or a, a circle is defined. But with the strain gauge method, we 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 look for bending. When we are bending um, a metal sheet. And uh, for that, it can be, we could make it that, that size. The ovality wow. sensor could be uh, that small, only to make, we only need the space to put uh, the strain gauges on top and on the bottom, that's all. But then the problem is that we need to deflect it somehow. It has to hold on the kill. And to, to hold it on the kiln, we need, we need strong magnets. And the shorter we go, the more force we need. If we keep the, the plate thickness the same, if we go thinner, then we could also go with uh, small magnets. But then the handling will not be uh, as good uh, anymore. But we could make it smaller. But I think for such a large machine, I think the, the size is already OK. And when yeah. the smaller we go, let's say we see uh, we see a limited area. The bigger we go, we get an average over uh, this one meter. If we go smaller, we see it per that distance. So if we have if we have uh, let's say not a uniform ovality, you know, on different places because we have blocks welded on the shell. The difference measuring in front of a block or between the block will be higher if the tool is smaller. So that's why we were the opinion that this is a is a good size and still handy. Right, right. Yeah, I mean it, it's 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 good enough to hold and, and it feels nice. Not not so small that I feel like I, if I drop it, it'll get destroyed. I mean it's not like we should drop it, but uh, it's a relatively robust. Uh, it's a tool. Um, I would say the main issue I run into when I travel is um, when I get questions on what it is, um, because it does look like a uh, uh, a bomb. <laughs> um, so I have had questions, especially when I go international into a border. Uh, that's always the uh, 
what are you using it for? Oh, it's to measure ovality. What's ovality? Uh, it's to measure these machines uh, on 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 the on the deflection of it, and then they go, all right, just just, just you're fine, yes. whatever. Well, I showed the video in the internet. There are videos uh, how to use it. Then it should be clear. Right, right, right. I I do try to have some documentation for. It. Now, is there anything you want to show um, on the sensor itself over here? Uh, uh, where we have it in the office? Is there something you want to um, show on it, or is there something you want to show uh, um, at your at your location? Yeah, here, I'll go I ahead mean, and. What I can show you here, I mean, on the bottom side, as I showed before, we have the four magnets. The middle ones, they are stiff. They have. A, stiff hole and the outer ones they have a, a little bit of a, a looseness so they have a spring inside so they can move in uh, in lateral direction so but not in the height so that makes it flexible for thermal expansion because when we put it on the hot king gel then it heats up during the rotation and it will expand and that we don't have the, the influence of these kind of forces uh, so they are uh, they are spring loaded um, on the upper oh here on the bottom side we also have a infrared sensor measuring the kiln shell temperature it's more for a reference um, and so you know i have a question on the sensor the bottom plate I know some of some of the um, customers we had have damaged that bottom plate. Is that bottom plate um, something you can rebend back, or is that something that you need to get a new one if you if you damage that bottom plate a little bit? Oh no, I mean it's not very sensitive. You can bend bend all the plates. They are uh, stainless steel, spring steel, so they are quite uh, quite strong. So, but but still, if you have a, a damage you can bend them back and this plate here is only the heat shield so it has not really a, there is no meaning for measurement we could also remove it for measurement but uh, then we would have the full radiation of the heat we would uh, we would um, get to the deflection plate so that's why we have this uh, heat shield uh, uh, good. But, uh, it's not very sensitive but still, we should avoid that it get uh, some somehow trapped between kiln shell and uh, uh, heat shields or thrust roller. Be careful. Watch first right. the space. But uh, still, when you have a damage of a magnet or a ceramic push, you can also be re also easily remove them. So I I I remove here by loosening this uh, T-handle. So then you get the, the T-handle out. And then you have the magnet out. So now it's removed. And then here, ceramic push, you can replace. And here, this is the spring I talked about. And we can also replace the magnet by opening here the thread. So then we put the new one back here. And we put it back into the tool. So I would say the, the part that would make this very tough to repair is if you damage the control box or damage the strain gauge itself. Um, so ultimately, the magnets and the ceramic bushings and the heat shield are relatively easy to replace. Yes, yes. If you have a damage uh, on the deflection plate, I mean, if it's just bent, you can also bend it back, but make sure that you, you have this shape. And this shape here fits to the kiln shell uh, in the minimum of, a, yeah, we say three, three and a half meter to eight meter diameter. So it depends how, how clean is the surface. You know, when, when we have a very small kiln, maybe two meters, then we, the magnets need to bend the, the plate more. So that means we need a stronger hold. And if we have a lot of dust or corrosion or paint on the kiln, maybe it will not stick as good as it should. And it might 
gegen Lose. When we lose the contact of one or the other magnet, then the reading will be wrong. That does not mean that it, it drops, because it might still stick on three magnets, but not on the four. So the measurement result will be wrong. It will not measure properly. We need the contact of all the four magnets to have a proper reading. So that, that might be the problem. And so if you do any, any modification, on the plate or you bend it forward or backward you can do but make sure that you have a proper hole and if you are not not sure then send it back and we will we will fix it but if you have a really an electrical damage on the strain gauges or in in the controller then uh, yeah we, then a bigger repair is needed Right, right. If you're in the U.S. or or in North America, you can always give us a call. We we'll we'll try to. We have some uh, spares and in, in-house that that we can try to service up. Um, if we don't, then we'll we'll chat with Thomas and get in getting some additional spares. Um, so let's see here. I think I have the Old Valley sensor too, because you got two versions, right? Um, do you want to show some of the modeling um, on some of the differences between O'Valley Sensor 1 and O'Valley Sensor 2? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, uh, this is now the second the second generation. It's the latest one. We had a model before. It looks the same, but uh, on the electronics, uh, we could do some uh, improvements because also uh, more modern components are available. So we, we changed uh, the batteries from uh, traditional batteries to lithium ion batteries. So we have much longer lifetime. So we can use, uh, use it the whole day. Um, then it's more heat resistant. Um, okay. A little bit more, but still electronics and batteries. The batteries are the limiting factors. So they don't like uh, much more than 60 degrees C. So that's uh, a change. And we added the, the infrared sensor to, to report the shell temperature uh, as well. And, and the rotation sensor is, more, is new, so we don't need calibration and nothing, so it should be okay. Okay, yeah, I, I noticed uh, you used to have the calibration um, um, component in there with the newer ones. I'm noticing there, there isn't. Um, now, I think you also changed the Bluetooth on it too, right? Uh, yeah, uh, the Bluetooth is, is, a diff, uh, is a different, uh, it's on the circuit board now directly, but for the user, it's about the same. You will not right. see much difference. Right. Okay, cool. Maybe is there anything you want to show? I'm sorry? <laughs> sorry, maybe it connects a little bit faster than the old one. So. <laughs> Um, is there anything you want to show um, on your on any of the cab modelings that you want to show any of the insights? Uh, yeah, if you are interested. Okay. Yeah, let's let's yeah, take okay, a quick okay. peek at that. Give me I'm give you the, moment. I'm gonna give you the presentation screen. Yeah, but um, I I have it. I have to say. Uh, I, I make it ready. I come back to that. Continue, and I when I'm ready, okay. I, I you know. Yeah, yeah. Once you're ready, um, well, just let me know, and I can I can go back to it. Yes. So, so this is about the shell thickness influence. Uh, tell me a little bit more about this one. This one's a the interesting view. Oh, yeah. The the shell the shell thickness. Uh, is is usually not very much compared to the size of the kiln, but still there are uh, there are um, how we say differences between the different uh, suppliers and also different age and uh, yeah. so we can have kilns which have a small diameter but uh, quite a thick um, a, th a thick shell, so they are more richy, so they maintain. They maintain the roundness better. Huh? So some are maybe thinner, so they, they deform more easy, and some other are more rigid. Right. So, and, and we can also see that some kings are much higher loaded than others. 
especially when we have heavy coating or we have a thicker uh, refractory. So that's why um, it, it can change. And this has an influence. So that means with the same gap on top, we can have a kiln gel, which is still quite round, but we have a big gap. And we have also relative movement, which shows us that we have a gap, but we still have not much uh, uh, ovality. And this is shown here in the graph. It's shown with the uh, with the green um, with the green so shell. So, if you have a, a kiln with a um, heavy section, and it's a relatively short heavy section, and then you have a um, section that's thinner, do you recommend to be still be on the heavy section as close to the tire as possible, or try to go on the other side where it's a little bit thinner shell? Yeah, there should not be much difference because, as I said, the, the, the ovality starts in the center and then goes to the side. But um, it depends on the shell thickness right under the tire. If you go a little bit further, then it's, it's getting less. But the influence of, of the thinner shell is not that much. You can measure. If you have space, of course, you stay on the, on the heavy section. Uh, on the same, but if it's too close to the block or unsafe or whatever, then you go a little bit further away. You can also do trials. You measure on different places, and you will see that it goes uh, that it goes lower. But uh, the influence is maybe yeah half of the half of the kiln shell diameter, maybe. Mm -hmm. But of course, it gets less and less. But if you do these uh, repetitive measurements on the same kiln, then you, it's still comparable. If you measure more or less on the same place each time, then the measurements are comparable. That makes sense. Because um, I, I tried it before, too, where I measured a little bit on the, on the heavier section closer to the tire and the thinner shell a little bit away from the tire. We're talking three feet versus four feet or a meter, meter and a quarter, meter and a third. And yes. my results were maybe, in, let's say, 0.45% ovality to 0.42, something like that. Yeah. That's enough. Yes, 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 yes. So I think um, it, it, it does not make a, a big difference. Because it, right. uh, anyway, the, the, the whole measurement has quite a, a lot of uh, factors which are influencing the value. So if you measure twice, you will get two different results easily. Because the kiln is not perfectly round, we can have also particles under the tire, between tire right. and kiln shell, and they give different values all the time. But Slightly different, so not ma major difference, but small difference, but still you can see it. And I think this kind of influences, they are as big as, the, uh, let's say, if we talk one foot further away or closer, you know, this impact is not that big. Right. Well, while you're, while you're looking for the CAD models, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about our relationship. Um, I think I mentioned this during the presentation. Uh, Industrial Kiln and Dryer Group is the exclusive distributor of Tom Tom Tools for North America. Uh, I, I mean, we've known each other for a while now, about six years. Um, we we are, I would say, Thomas and I talk every couple weeks, maybe every week, depending on the, the topic or the uh, measure of interest or the concept of interest. And so we, we work pretty closely together. Uh, I know uh, 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 Thomas uh, Reiniger is um, in, uh, in South America right now, um, so so we all we all have a discussion every every uh, 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 six months or so. Uh, Industrial Kiln and Dryer can do a lot of the TomTom Tom product servicing and training. Um, it's not always practical to have Thomas go show you how to use an ovality sensor. Uh, from Switzerland to somewhere in uh, uh, in uh, uh, Washington or, or Utah or Virginia. So uh, part of this relationship is to help a lot of the technical questions that we have. That's why we try to 
be as good on understanding the core concept as best we can. So if you have technical questions, we can help. And also, since we use the tools, if you run into a problem with the tools, we'll, we'll typically be able to help. Hey, you know, I, I'm having issues with this connection or, hey, um, uh, what's the latest version of the software or what, um, what does this reading mean? We can help with that. Training-wise, uh, that's also very straightforward. We, we know how to use just about every one of the tools. Um, so we can we can teach you guys on some of the training. So you got you want to talk about your new stuff, or you wanna you wanna show your screen first, huh? Um, I yes, and on our website you can anyway you can download the three D model as well. Cool. Uh, it's a three D PDF. I think that's the, the more, most interesting. Um, of the of the ovality sensor or this uh, uh, the the creep measurement. Yes. When, when, now I can uh, share the or you can share oh. the screen. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll share. Oops. Yes. So. Did you get it? I think I'm here. Can you he uh, can you see me? Oh yeah, that's awesome. So this this you can download from our webpage from, uh, I think, from all or almost all our tools. You can download so you can see the tool. Then you click, uh, and this is a nice feature, but you need the uh, Acrobat reader. With another PDF reader, I'm not sure if you can, if you can, uh, if you have to see uh, the same functionality. But here you can click on, a, on an item or a component. Then you go to show model three, and then you see this uh, here, and then you can you can select one piece and you can remove it. Then you see further below, or here you can click on the ceramic push as well, and then you can see it below, what's inside. So here you have these functions you have for yourself. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's nice technology. Yeah. So you can uh, you can have a look into things yourself. But I think nice. it's not much to see. I mean, the, the the most important I have shown you if you have a damage on a magnet, we supply in the box. We supply spare magnets. Uh, if we, if we, stop that. we supply spare magnets. Together with the tool, and uh, you can get it for uh, 50 bucks. You get the new one, and they are heat resistant up to 330 degrees centigrade. Um, then maybe you can say, oh, the, but the king shell can be hotter. Yes, that's true. But as the time for the for the ovality sensor to go around is quite short. So in that short period of time, uh, the magnets, they, they do not heat up that fast. And um, uh, there, is, there is also a, a, a temperature sensor uh, inside the magnet, and it transmits uh, the temperature to the software. And if it gets too hot, if it gets too hot, you get here the warning on the LED. First, it turns to yellow. And if uh, still it gets hotter, it will blink fast uh, in red. And you will get a warning on the on the PC screen. So that's why it's uh, oh, it's it should be quite safe. But still, don't don't let it on the kiln for too long. And do not measure kilns which are running in uh, in auxiliary mode when they are very hot, because then it it might take 10 minutes for one turn, and then in these 10 minutes it can overheat. So it's not made for that. It's made for normal operation where we have maybe one to four RPMs, but not zero. That makes sense. <laughs> so for that, that's the only thing, uh, be careful. Oh, and maybe another tip, when you place it, don't hold it like that. Not, not like that. Hold it with one hand, hold it with one hand and place it Usually from six o'clock under the king, you place it with the king, hold it like that. 
These T-handles here, the handlebars here, they are for removal. To place it, hold it here, it's better. Right, I try to keep it with one hand now. I'll tell you, um, one of the things that's worth noting is to make sure um, to wear your gloves, number one, um, and number two, that it is very hot. It, it reminds me of uh, cooking in the oven and then forgetting that it's still hot and then touching it. Um, I've been, uh, I've done that and that sucked. So I, uh, I realized that we need to make sure uh, keep the keep the leather gloves on or heat resistant gloves on. It's it's a it's a it's a dumb thing to forget, but it it gets really hot. Yes, and better use your second hand with the gloves to hold yourself that you have a, a stable stand. Yes. That that you you can easily get dizzy when the kiln is turning in front of you and you only see rotating kiln gel. So better hold with the other hand somewhere on the heat shield or on the pole or so on a handrail and use only one hand to place the, the tool on the kiln shell. So that's the benefit of the light weight. You don't need both hands to lift it. Right. I mean, overall, Kilns are still huge uh, machines that, with the pinch points, will, um, will either dismember you or will kill you. So um, having it smaller, having it where you can use one hand uh, drastically does improve the um, safety. The other thing is you don't have to stand there and take the heat uh, because on that beam, on the big beams, you have to stand and hold it and get really hot. And and because uh, I've seen guys use it, they turn red. So this one, you just place it up, go run to your laptop, type it in. So so even on the heat exposure, um, because it's Bluetooth, and you don't have to manually uh, measure it. I think that also improves the safety. Yes. So mm -hmm. um, the creep monitor, uh, your your uh, mechanical kill monitoring system with the creep monitor um, component. So tell me more about this. This looks relatively new, or it is new. Yeah, it's new, yes. Uh, I mean, there is, the, there is a direct relationship between ovality and relative movement or creep. So that means the, the gap on top, the bigger the gap, it makes us more ovality. So that means we have to maintain a small gap and the gap we cannot measure during operation. But we have a very, a very simple, uh, let's say, indicator and this is the creep or the relative movement. So because the, because the kiln shell is smaller in diameter, it has also a smaller circumference than the tire. So that means when the kiln makes one turn, the tire has not made a full turn. There is a, a few millimeter or it is missing or maybe one, one inch is missing. Mm -hmm. And this small offset we can measure with, uh, with some sensors and many kilns are already equipped with it. So they have a switch flag on the tire and one on the kiln and the timer is or a counter is comparing the timing from one kiln turn to, uh, uh, to the tire turn. Um, yeah, it's like that. Huh? So we have two different Two different diameters, and if I rotate it, the smaller di the, the item with the smaller diameter, of course, is a little bit faster than the other one. And here in this uh, in this creep monitor, we do uh, measure this effect. And uh, I mean, this, this kind of measurement already exists since many years. But uh, what is different on our system is um, uh, it's it's quite precise because we have a, a how we say a state of the art uh, microcontroller uh, in it, uh, which measures very precisely the timing, and the timing is also related to the sensor, which gives us the the, the impulse per turn. So we have 
this kind of switch flag and we have an optical sensor. We have it also with inductive sensor, but it's not as precise. And in the new version, we measure the teeth of the gear. And why we are doing that is um, because when we have the teeth of the gear, we have about 250 or 300 pulses. And the system can be stopped and start again during the heat up. When we go with the traditional system where we have one pulse per turn, then we have to make a full turn. And then after the next full turn, we, we have the result. And the turns have to be with uniform speed. But now when we go with that method, we don't need the uniform speed anymore we, because we have so many impulses from the from the gears here and this makes the yeah this creep monitor a, a good solution if you are in the need to have a, a precise measurement also during during a start and stop and start and stop are usually the most critical uh, you know, the most critical uh, situation to get to get the tire locked because when we heat up the shell the shell gets the temperature first and the tire gets hot much much later so the thermal expansion of the of the tire takes place much much later than uh, the king gel and that's the problem during heating up so we need to heat up slowly and we would like to have also reliable values of the creep during the heat up. And heating up is with the auxiliary drive very slow or even in sections so that we do every 20 minutes, we do a quarter turn or half of a turn. And uh, with this system now... So Thomas, it's um, I think uh, this, uh, I know some of our audience is um, uh, rotary dryers too. I think, I think this, if if you're the group that wants to um, have a way to monitor creep, whether it's a kiln or a dryer, and um, not necessarily have a person go to each of the each of the units to manually measure, this is an excellent way to have a, a little bit more automation to that where you can read off of the screen. I think that that does have value there. Um, I think because, uh, you know, every time we do a creep measure, you actually interact with the unit um, with the chop method or whatever other methods we have. I do like that you switch to an optical sensor versus uh, inductive distance measure sensor. So this will give you a little bit better live feed, live measures. I mean, overall, uh, if you guys want to measure creep but don't want to have someone standing or uh, standing there measuring, I think this is an excellent way. Obviously, you want to calibrate every once in a while, but I mean, I, I like it. I, I saw the inside box. I mean, it's a it's a neat tool. Yes, I mean the the thing is with the safety when we go there with the with the marker and we mark a, a line, it's uh, somebody has to go there, and we would we would sure. like to avoid that as much as possible, especially yes. for routine for routine measurements and. Uh, this kind of measurement should be uh, an online. I mean, we are talking about Industry 4.0 and we would like to have everything in the control room right. and automated. I mean, this is for sure is, is uh, one thing we really need. When we have tires which are loose, like we have here, most of the kilns have, so the, uh, where we have the gap, we, we need to have an online system nowadays. It does not need to be that one, but some kind of a measurement system, you should have an online one. The other one with the chalk, I think it's good to verify if the system still operates properly, or if the signals are not mixed up between the tires, I saw that as well. You know, for that it's good when you go maybe once a year to verify your system is giving the right value. But the rest of the time it should be done online and we should have right. it all right. available because it fluctuates with the, with the shell temperature and with the ambient temperature. So that's why I'm convinced that we should have that uh, on all, all the kilns, we should have something like that. Uh, 
Right. Uh, it's, it's the, the, old, the old traditional way which we have with these uh, switches. It's okay as well. It's better than nothing. But with the switches, you know, when, when it, it, it thousands and millions of times we have this uh, uh, movement on the, on the switch, then a mechanical switch is maybe not the best solution. But for sure, one of the cheapest. If you want something more, uh, more, uh, how you say, with more lifetime, yeah, more lifetime, or let's say without wear, then use a use a inductive sensor, a heat resistant. Nowadays they are available, heat resistant inductive sensors. Uh, they have no wear, so they are excellent. If you want to go very precise with the intermittent uh, rotation. Maybe not needed everywhere, but then you go with optical sensors like we have shown here. Cool. Well, overall, um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to um, ask some questions in the question box. Uh, this is session one of four. Um, today is April 15th. We talked about the old valley sensor with Thomas. Uh, next week, we're we're going to talk about gear run out, uh, um, and in a sense, talk about the uh, inductive distance uh, measure sensor. Uh, that one has more capability on top of the gear run out that we can dig into. And as you guys have seen, we can go in a lot of different routes with videos, with presentations. Then we got the measuring wheel and the kiln shell laser. So we'll have that every week, every Wednesday at 10. Um, if you want to contact us, we've got uh, www.industrialkiln.com. We have a section with uh, TomTom Tom Tools also on there, 877-316-6140. Uh, contact at industrialkiln.com if you guys want to email us. Um, I say this every time. I say this uh, uh, because um, with the current situation, we want to be careful. Again, um, like I said all the other times, we're in essential business because you guys are in essential business. We're open. We're ready to help. Overall, I want everyone to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay sane, okay? Because uh, when you're home in quarantine, you, you want to do things. You want to have activities to, to keep your mind occupied. Um, with that, hey, Thomas, we appreciate it. It was a great presentation. Do uh, you have any uh, last, uh, last words? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, okay, cool. Well, hey, we appreciate everybody. Uh, come see us Thanks. again next week. We'll talk about the uh, gear run out measurements. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.